Okay, welcome to the first class of the spring semester. So we appreciate everybody coming today and finding the room. That's always a challenge on the first few weeks of class. Uh, I'm Jerry, I work for Sirius. Uh, Professor Tian is, is traveling this week, so he'll be managing the class and he should be here for most of the, of the classes. Just a couple of housekeeping things. If during the course of the, of the class, if you have a question, uh, push the button on the microphone to ask your question so it gets recorded. If you haven't uh, checked in on the roster before you leave, make sure you check your name off the roster list so you get credit for attending. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. It's uh, Sri Harsha Adagani. He's a postdoc graduate research associate here at Purdue University. He earned his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Rutgers. His research focuses mainly on security of cyber physical systems, and his research is to secure cyber physical systems by using physical and control invariants. So I, I'm here to learn about that myself. His research interests also include IoT embedded system security, trusted computing, secure boot, runtime monitoring and detection, physical side channels, and applied cryptography. So pretty broad spectrum. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Sri Harsha and let him take it away. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, contactless control flow monitoring. Uh, so for uh, control flow monitoring here, we used physical side channels, which is uh, electromagnetic radiations, which are emitted by uh, any of the electronic components. Uh, I mainly focus on uh, uh, safety critical systems here. So what is a safety critical system? So safety critical system is a system whose failure or malfunction will uh, lead to one of the following results, uh, one or more of the following outcomes, which is like, uh, serious death or injury to people uh, that is like, for example, uh, Toyota's unintentional acceleration which killed uh, 89 people. Uh, or it could also be a loss or severe damage to uh, any property or infrastructure, like you can see the plane crashing into a building. Or it could also be environmental harm, uh, which is like the BP oil leak, um, so which caused uh, environmental harm. Uh, so what are safety critical systems? So safety critical system uh, comprises of physical system, as you can see here, uh, the aircraft, which is a physical system, and uh, an embedded system. Embedded system involves uh, software and hardware, which is actually controlling the physical system. So together, it's called cyber physical system. And also human aspect is also required in the safety critical systems. Uh, so industrial control systems are one of the safety critical systems. Uh, especially few of them. So I'll talk about that. Here you can see uh, the three layers of uh, industrial control system, the bottom three layers, which are on operational technology side. Uh, the bottom layer, the bottom one, what you can see is the uh, field level, which is uh, your sensors and actuators, like any meters um, or any sensors, like for example, something measuring the pressure on a in a cylinder or something like that and actuators, something like motors which are running. So these kind of things are the sensors and the actuators. Uh, the next layer is the um, uh, control level where you have uh, industrial controllers like for example PLCs or uh, RTUs. PLC is programmable logic controllers, so which are industrial grade computers uh, which are used in manufacturing plants or any other uh, industrial control facilities like uh, nuclear power plants or these kind of uh, things. So the main function of these are to get the uh, input from the sensors, uh, which is from the under uh, level, and then perform some operations on top of that and then uh, uh, decide on what actuation commands to be given to the actuators. Uh, so uh, and another function of these are it can also uh, take inputs from the SCADA system or the human machine interface the control commands and uh, send it out to the actuators. So uh, in my scenario, I'm just con uh, uh, considering the industrial control system, the control monitoring on industrial control systems, specifically on programmable logic controllers. Uh, so one thing is like, uh, one question a lot of people might ask, is it easy to uh, attack industrial control systems? So this is just one, one simple example of uh, like what it is. If you look at numbers, on the attack surface uh, wise, you can see from the power plants, this is a, a US power grid, transmission grid. You can see that uh, it has 7,000 power plants 
around 19,000 power generators, 55,000 substations, and 450,000 miles of uh, high voltage power lines. And this is not even considering other uh, equipments like smart meters or any distribution things and all these things. Uh, so you can see that it has a huge attack surface and location wise, uh, most of them are actually placed in very uh, remote locations in very hostile environments. So yeah, you can decide like if it's easier to attack or not. So these are some of the uh, malicious attacks on industrial control system. I'm just going through some of the very popular and famous ones. There are a lot more. Uh, so industrial control systems are mostly examples of some of them are like the power grids, uh, the manufacturing plants, uh, your oil and gas refinery, nuclear power plants. These are the ones you see how critical they are. Uh, so one of the example, uh, the first known uh, malicious attack on industrial control system was by Stuxnet malware which attacked the nuclear enrichment plant. Uh, the another popular one which I would like to mention is crash override, uh, which was on Ukrainian power uh, system. And the third one uh, which I like to mention is Triton, which was on oil and gas refinery. Uh, so what kind of attacks can be done? So there are special kind of uh, attacks which are performed on this industrial control systems. Uh, they are called kinetic cyber attacks. So what are kinetic cyber attacks? So kinetic cyber attacks are a direct or indirect assault on uh, which, is, which, which will cause damage uh, to properties or any equipments or uh, kill people or injure them. So these kind of things uh, solely based on the exploitation of the vulnerabilities present in the cyber site. So this is a cyber, uh, a kinetic cyber attacks. So if you want to see some of the examples, again, uh, the Stuxnet is one of the uh, great examples here for kinetic cyber attacks, where uh, the cyber part was attacked uh, and the result of which was destroying uh, around 1,000 centrifuges. So here you can see that uh, it destroyed some physical property. Uh, the other one I would like to mention is uh, the water treatment plant control uh, in Australia, where uh, attacker was able to mix the uh, tre uh, cleanly treated water with the untreated water, causing poison to the water. So this was one of it. And the other one, you can see that uh, cyber attack on Ukrainian power plant uh, causing blackout, uh, power outage. Uh, other one was um, hack attack on a uh, steel plant in Germany, causing damage to the equipments. So these are some of the uh, kinetic cyber attacks. So uh, my work basically uh, is to protect against this kind of uh, kinetic cyber attacks. So the main problem here is uh, to either detect or prevent uh, this kind of cyber attacks which are running on industrial control systems. So I'm specifically concentrating on a programmable logic controllers. So if everything runs well, then it's okay. If there is an attack, you should be able to detect it as soon as possible and uh, take preventive actions. Uh, so for that, uh, you have few previous literature work from the literature, what, uh, what are being done here. One of it is the offline analysis of verifying the control logic uh, on the PLCs. So here you can see the green circle is a bump in a wire, which is a device. Um, so it is called a trusted safety verifier. So what this does is it actually intercepts the uh, program which is programmed from the control operator to the PLCs. So any program, what you want to program it to the PLC, so this bump in the wire uh, intercepts those uh, program, uh, analyzes it, verifies for the safety properties to see uh, if the program is being uh, run on the PLC, there are no physical damages or violation of any safety properties. So these kind of thing, verification uh, it does. And uh, for example, if there is any violation, it returns back to the operator saying that, okay, this program, if you program it onto the PLC can cause the safety violations. So if there is no safety violation, uh, then it go, goes ahead and uh, programs onto the PLC. So this was offline analysis. And uh, one problem with this is any uh, runtime bugs or attacks might not be able to detect using this kind of, uh, solutions. Uh, so another one is a runtime PLC execution monitoring, uh, where you can see that um, 
Uh, one example is cyber physical access control, where uh, you have some code which is uh, programmed onto the PLC for the execution monitoring during runtime. So in this case, you can see that there are a lot of limitations for this as well, although it can uh, capture any attacks during runtime. So some of the limitations here are uh, real-time constraints. So PLC work are real-time systems which work on uh, very tight deadlines and all the deadlines have to be met. Uh, so that's one of the constraints of the PLCs. So here, uh, when you add some program onto the uh, PLC, so this could compromise the real-timeness of the uh, system. And it could also have a resource overhead like because you inject some code or instrument some code on the PLC. And the other one, uh, the limitation is that the same attack vector. For example, if the attacker has control over the PLC, then it, it's not that difficult for him to deactivate this execution monitoring or change something on this execution monitoring. And uh, another problem is uh, most of the systems what are being used uh, right now are legacy systems and most of the control engineers don't want to change or uh, probe or do anything onto the system which is already working. And according to some sources, it's also been uh, said that some of the legacy systems don't even have uh, additional memory to even perform security patches. Uh, so these kind of things might be a little difficult in these cases. Uh, and the other other case, what are the limitations of this is you can see that this is a, a, a previous work uh, by one of my friend. Uh, it's called Hey, uh, my malware knows physics. So attacking PLCs with uh, physical model aware rootkit. So in this case, what happens is you can see that the, the physical system is a power system in this case, which has the sensors and the actuators. And you have a firmware which takes the actual measurements and sends it to the legitimate uh, control logic and same way it gets the uh, legitimate controls from the user and then passes it to the physical system. Uh, but one thing is the, if, if this kind of system is attacked by a rootkit in a firmware, so what could happen? So that, that this was a malware uh, in the previous literature. So you can see here, so what this does is it has two layers. One is the benign physical model and one is the malicious physical model. So what this basically does is uh, it shows the operator that, okay, everything is working fine in the system. So that's on the benign physical model uh, part of it. On the malicious uh, physical model side, what it does is it performs some malicious operations below so that the user can see that, okay, everything is running well, but on the actual system, it's not running properly, so there's been an attack. So even these kind of things cannot be detected uh, easily by runtime monitoring because the system already is compromised. So even for these kind of things, uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to detect uh, any control flow violations in, in this case. So that's why we used uh, electromagnetic radiations, which is a physical side channel uh, to capture the uh, control flow and then see if it is legitimate one or if it's something by an attacker. So here you can see that uh, these are the control logic program which is running on Allen Bradley PLC. And uh, we have electromagnetic radiations which are emitted by that and uh, that is being uh, captured by the electromagnetic probe. So this is basically uh, air gap, there's no contact. So it's contactless uh, control flow monitoring. Um, they ha like previously, there are there have also been some work on electromagnetic radiations uh, to crack some cryptographic algorithms or, or to do some uh, execution profiling, which is very close to our work. Um, so, how how are these electromagnetic radiations emitted? So, any of the embedded systems have uh, semiconductor chips. Uh, in this case, I'm just considering it as a CMOS component, uh, but it, it is the same with all the other things as well. So any operations you perform on them uh, causes change of current uh, in a semiconductor chip. So this change of current will actually lead to electromagnetic field generated, and this is emitted. Uh, so we capture this to do some execution monitoring. So in this case, uh, on Allen Bradley PLC, when we run, we found out that different instructions actually have uh, different patterns of this electromagnetic radiation which are emitted. 
Uh, if you see this, this is a spectrogram of different instructions. On the x-axis, you have the frequency, and on the y-axis, you have, uh, it's actually a time, but we split up into different uh, instructions. So here you can see a lot of different instructions from very simple ones from XOR to uh, even the complicated ones like PID controllers, you can see. And uh, so, uh, so from this, it might not be very easy to detect that uh, the pattern is very distinctive for different instructions. But when we do some signal processing, uh, it looks much clearer. And our next question was, uh, since we were able to uh, uh, capture this, uh, are we able to uh, identify it distinctively? So for that, we took uh, six different instructions from six different categories, ranging from automatic uh, bit comparison, uh, array mapping, branch control, some advanced math, and even complex um, instructions like uh, PID, program over logic controller. And you can see here, uh, this is a confusion matrix, and you can see here we were able to successfully distinguish between different instructions. And for this, we used uh, random forest decision trees uh, with 1,000 samples for uh, training and 500 samples for testing. And each sample was uh, 200 microseconds uh, length. Uh, so since we are able to dis uh, like uh, distinguish between different instructions, our next um, aim or target was, can we differentiate between uh, two different paths in a control uh, program? Like for example, in this case, as you can see, uh, the blue line represents the control flow of path one, and the red one represents the control flow in path two. So our main aim was, can we distinguish between them? Uh, so for that, we actually created a framework here. You can see this. Uh, so here we have uh, two different stages. One is the uh, training stage and other one is the deployment stage. And here you can see the red line represents the training stage uh, modules and the green one represents the deployment stage ones. So the first stage in training is to collect the training signals from the uh, PLC, whatever the control logic it's running. And the second one is to convert them into a spectrogram. And the third one is to uh, create a program behavioral model, which is later used to detect if there is a legitimate uh, execution path or any malicious execution path. And on the deployment stage, what we do is we collect the query signals, convert them again to the spectrogram, and then uh, feed it into the behavioral model to see if we have the uh, legitimate execution path or if it's something abnormal. Uh, in the execution path. So first stage is the signal collection during the training. So this is a PLC program uh, which is written in a ladder or logic, which is a programmable logic controller's language, one of the programmable controller logic's language. Uh, so we generate test cases and uh, consider, uh, like uh, capture all the electromagnetic signals. So how do we generate test cases? So what we do is, uh, we extract all the uh, path predicates in the control logic uh, to determine path constraints of all the paths, and then we solve it using uh, SMT solver and generate inputs for that. And we use those inputs and uh, in, we use those inputs to feed it into the programmable control logic and force the programmable log logic controller to uh, follow each and every path which is there on the control logic. So based on that, we have uh, execution path, like we traverse through all the execution paths and collect the electromagnetic signals for all the execution paths. Uh, so some challenges, uh, what, uh, what we had was, uh, we, like the system has a noisy environment, like there are a lot of uh, white noises as well as noise from different other components which are also uh, running on, change of electric currents, which will also generate some electromagnetic uh, fields. Uh, and another other, other problem what we had is, as you can see this, uh, different instructions have different uh, cycles for running and the execution time is different for them. So um, it was not that easy for us to test it on the time domain. So we got better results on frequency domain, which I'll show uh, in coming slides. And uh, here you can see that uh, 
this is a graph of time on x-axis and uh, amplitude on y-axis. So this is a signal collected on time domain. So what we do is we have a sliding window uh, with overlap and we split up, uh, we extract certain signal segments from those uh, complete signal and then convert them into the frequency domain. As you can see on the left hand side, it is uh, time versus amplitude. On the right, we, after we convert it into frequency domain, it's frequency versus magnitude. So this is a frequency spectrum where on x-axis you have frequency and on y-axis you have time or um, in seconds. So you can see that uh, when it takes certain execution path, it has very specific uh, uh, electromagnetic patterns which can be recognized uh, based on which we can determine which control path it is taking. So once we come to the program behavioral model, uh, the input for that is the uh, spectrum sequence which we had uh, by converting time domain to frequency domain. And then uh, we use that to predict what control uh, path it is taking. Uh, so for that we used uh, LSTM, uh, sequential neural network model, because the signal what we get is sequential in running of instructions. Uh, so in this case, we have the hidden state vectors onto it, the time steps and uh, uh, history information and the current input uh, for LSTM to determine the output. And here you can see on the x-axis, we have the execution path. On uh, y-axis, we have the probability. The probability is like which path uh, it is taking. So based on certain uh, threshold, we determine if it is taking the right execution path or the wrong one. And here you can see uh, on the deployment stage, what we do is uh, since we already have the trained model uh, running and then once we deploy the PLC on the field, we use the same electromagnetic probe to collect the data and then convert them into the spectrogram uh, and frequency domain spectrogram and feed it into the program behavioral model to check uh, if it's a legitimate one or um, or if it's an attacked execution path. So here you can see the execution path and the probability graph where you have the likelihood score. And on the bottom, you can see a graph where you have uh, x-axis is the likelihood score and the y-axis is probability. Likelihood score is that uh, it's likelihood that it's a legitimate path or the anomalous one. And uh, the red ones are the anomalous ones and the blue ones are the legitimate ones. As you can see, uh, the legitimate uh, execution paths are more skewed towards the right hand side which is uh, which represents more likelihood and the red ones are skewed towards the uh, left hand side which shows that okay there are very li very less likely and they are anomalous ones so what we did is we fixed a threshold uh, depending on which we determine if it's a legitimate execution path or the malicious execution path uh, so this can be varied depending on um, instruction granularity and uh, uh, like other things. So here, this was our experimental setup. Uh, to start with the PLC, we had uh, Allen Bradley PLC, which is most popular uh, PLC in North America. And for the EM sensor, what we did is we just use a microphone and we removed the transducer. So this acted as an antenna. So that, that acted as a EM probe. And uh, uh, we used amplifier to amplify the signal which was collected by the uh, EM probe. And then we had oscilloscope uh, to sample it at 50 megahertz. And this is one of the board from the PLC. Uh, so this board had like different components. We wanted to check which component had uh, maximum uh, the strength of the signal. Uh, so we tried on different components like SMD capacitor, FPGA chips, as well as uh, some proprietary chip, Allen Bradley's proprietary chip. So here you can see that uh, the x-axis is again the frequency and you have for different uh, chips, that's a proprietary chip, FPGAs and SMD capacitors. As you can see the magnitude, uh, the strength of the signal for proprietary chip was maximum because of its uh, size. So we started uh, collecting signals from that proprietary chip. 
and for evaluation programs uh, we evaluated on like variety of classes of programs uh, from cryptography uh, control systems to some signal processing or numerical methods on various different applications like object tracking or uh, value searching oh yeah go ahead of emanations in um, other uh, PLCs or did you just uh, test that one board? Yeah, we actually tested only on Allen Bradley PLC, but uh, I assume that it will be the same with all the other PLCs as well. So it will be the same with any of the uh, controllers which uses semiconductor devices or anything, such kind of things, yeah. Um, so yeah, these are different uh, examples what we had and uh, we compared our solution with uh, the baseline uh, model, which is the hi hidden Markov model, which was from the previous literature works. Uh, here we uh, used both time domain and frequency domain just for comparison part of it. And here you can see the execution tracking accuracy uh, for different programs uh, on four different categories on the time domain, the hidden Markov model and the LSTM, and frequency domain, hidden Markov model and the LSTM. And you can see that uh, on the frequency domain, LSTM uh, showed very great results on this uh, with tracking accuracy of close to 99% in this case. Um, and this is the area under the curve where on x-axis you have uh, false positive rates, on y-axis you have uh, true positive rates for different signals on frequency domain, uh, LSTM and HMM, and then uh, time domain, uh, LSTM and HMM. As you can see, uh, the blue one uh, represents the frequency domain LSTM, uh, where the area under the curve was 0.99. So the higher uh, the area under the curve, that means that you can distinguish between the uh, malicious execution path and the legitimate execution path very well. So if it's one, you can perfectly determine everything. If it's 0.99, it's a little lower. As you can see for different things, uh, for time domain, it's lower compared to the frequency domain. And for uh, LSTM is much greater than HMM. And this is another uh, thing what we had, the slicing, sliding window versus the uh, classification accuracy. Uh, if you remember previously, I told that we collect the signal and then slice it on the signal spectrum. So this is what it is, and uh, we, uh, we tested it on all four uh, different um, categories where we uh, performed. So uh, as you can see that uh, the smaller uh, windows have lower frequency resolutions. That means uh, you don't capture all the signals, and on the higher ones, you have worst temporal granularity. That means even the small changes, anything which goes missing, we just capture the big picture of it. So that's the thing, that's the reason. So there is a trade-off between uh, frequency resolution and temporal granularity here. Uh, so this is again a uh, performance in, for a uh, sliding window versus the area under the graph. As you can see, uh, for our scenario, like the 200 microseconds was the best one, uh, trade-off between these uh, performance. And uh, yeah, here you can see uh, the window size versus the processing time. And on the uh, x-axis, you can see that uh, the sliding window on y-axis is the process time. And uh, you can see that uh, HMM, the hidden Markov model, is much faster than the LSTM. But on accuracy-wise, LSTM is much better than the hidden Markov model. So yeah, it's a trade-off between the accuracy and the uh, timing. Uh, but the timing was very low, so it should be good. And for uh, higher sliding windows, we have uh, fewer recurrences, that's why it's lower, the timing. And for uh, lower end of the spectrum, where it is like a lesser uh, slide, sliding window, we have only few instructions or few signal patterns, so that's why it's faster on that side. Uh, yeah, to conclude, uh, yeah, this was uh, runtime execution monitoring, which was contactless uh, without any instrumentation or any uh, code injected onto the system. And it's perfectly air-gapped. Uh, we use electromagnetic side channels for uh, execution monitoring. And uh, online signal processing and 
program behavior model was performed here and uh, uh, yeah we got around 99% uh, accuracy for uh, control logic programs yeah thank you Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, one of the challenges uh, you faced was uh, external electromagnetic noise, white noise influence. So my que I have a question regarding that. Uh, would you say um, w during the signal processing process through the oscilloscope, did you use any sort of uh, like a low pass filter based on the uh, frequency you sensed from the proprietary, proprietary uh, Allen Bradley chip for instructions? Did, did you set a filter of any sort to a threshold? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we sampled at 50 megahertz. So we uh, we wanted to eliminate a lot of noise which are on the lower range of it. So we mostly focused on the higher one. So we used a low-pass filter for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, could you please clarify the adversary model of the defense? Mm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in, our, in, our, in our model, what we consider is uh, the defensive solution is being provided by the people, internal people, mm -hmm. who have access to the code, as well as the PLCs, and they have physical access. Mm -hmm. So that's what we assume. And uh, so we assume that all those... Uh, actors or all those systems are protected and trusted and uh, what we assume is the attacker can either uh, remotely uh, gain some access mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, PLCs either directly or through any other uh, internal medium okay so this is our so model. basically the attacker can, of course they cannot have physical access and to change yes the yes exactly device. yeah the attacker cannot have physical access okay so so how close does it need to be to capture these signals yeah between? so uh, it, it actually depends so in our case it was uh, um, it was around five centimeters if it's greater than five centimeters then it's not that good uh -huh. but uh, there are like recent papers uh, which came out, something called uh, screaming signals, mm -hmm. if you know it. Mm -hmm. So what they do is uh, they actually tell that uh, some of the uh, microcontroller chips which have both analog and digital circuitry. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, what happens is the analog circuit picks up noise from the digital circuit and then amplifies it and transmits. So that's much higher. So they, they were able to pick it up with like 20 meters distance or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, as of now, the PLCs don't have uh, any transmission signals or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, PLCs are very similar to RTUs, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. remote terminal units. Mm -hmm. So, but the remote terminal units uh, are equipped with a lot of other things like Wi-Fi or uh, GPRS or these kind of things. So, yeah, in that case, it might work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, is your idea to um, suggest they uh, create something to install um, within these units um, that just runs autonomously, uh, checks and compares, and then just reports to the operators directly? Yes, that's true. So uh, our main motive was not to uh, instrument the code or touch any of the components which are already present. So by this kind of solution, what happens is you can actually create this framework and then just um, pack it as a small box or something and just place it just beside the uh, system which is already running. So it can just capture and send the signals to the computer uh, or like the system where you do all the processing kind of thing, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank our speaker again. Thank <laughs> you.